Business decisions made in the interest of maximizing shareholder value have caused mass layoffs, environmental catastrophes, an endless list of corporate frauds, and record inequality in the workplace. The very same CEO who made millions of dollars by being the first champion of maximizing shareholder value in the 60s called it the dumbest idea in the world, and something that could rock capitalism to its core. But worst of all, maximizing shareholder value isn't even good for the shareholders. Indeed, um, managers, the CEO, have a, they have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders to be concerned only with the bottom line. We think this is wrong, a, a serious mistake. But continue to create the capacity to be able to reward our shareholders as we have done in 2023 and as we hope to continue to do in 2024. Roundtable today sparking a debate about the purpose of a corporation and why maximizing shareholder returns is no longer the main goal. If you hate your job, here is a history lesson for you that might make it start to make sense. In 1916, the Ford Motor Company had revolutionized the automobile industry with the Ford Model T. Henry Ford, the founder and majority stockholder of the company, wanted to use the surplus cash they had accumulated to build additional plants and hire even more workers to build even more cars. Ford had also famously and controversially raised factory worker wages significantly and offered benefits like the 40-hour work week. In press interviews, Ford spoke about his plans for the company. My ambition is to employ still more men, to spread the benefits of the industrial system to the greatest possible number to help them build up their lives and their homes. To do this, we are putting the greatest share of our profits back into the business. This angered minority shareholders in the company that just wanted him to lower wages again, raise the price of the Model T, and keep paying them a regular dividend. Since Ford was the majority shareholder in the company though, their options were limited. So they took him to court, but the court sided with the minority shareholders. Ford was forced to consider the best interests of shareholders above his other business ambitions. This was the case that set the precedent for shareholder primacy in America, meaning the board of directors and executives in a company must always try to maximize shareholder value to the best of their ability. Some have mistaken this ruling to mean that CEOs and the boards that appoint them have a legal mandate to maximize shareholder value, but the reality is that this simply isn't true. The case was awarded in favor of the minority shareholders, but it upheld the business judgment rule, which means that executives can do what they believe is in the best interest of the company, even if it doesn't make the number on a stock chart go up. Ford himself wasn't paying his workers more and making new jobs because he wanted to be nice. He was a ruthless businessman who wanted to control a larger share of the growing automobile market. By paying his workers better and offering them higher wages, he was just denying his competitors a workforce. And by pricing his Model T's just above cost, he made it almost impossible for any other manufacturer to sell a profitable budget automobile. The biggest irony of all of this is the minority shareholders that took Ford to court were John and Horace Dodge. They owned about 10% of the company and used their special dividends to fund growth of their own company, Dodge, a car maker that would eventually become one of Ford Motor's biggest rivals. So this court ruling was bad for the company's leaders, bad for workers, bad for the country, and bad for the shareholders in Ford who sacrificed market dominance for a quick payday. But there are three reasons why people still believe in maximizing shareholder value and three reasons why companies that operate this way are almost guaranteed to fail. So it's time to learn how money works to find out how the worst idea in business history became the new normal for corporate America. This week's lesson is sponsored by Delete Me. Did you know that your personal data is sold online by data brokers? You have the right to your privacy and to protect your personal data. When data brokers sell your data, it puts you at risk, including the risk of identity theft and being stalked. Delete Me helps you keep your personal info private. I personally use Delete Me, and it's pulled my information away from a variety of data brokers. And the process is easy. It's a hands-free subscription service that removes your personal information that's being sold online, including your phone number and home address. Simply submit your info, let the experts find it, and get it removed from the internet. And afterwards, it monitors sites and repeats removal as needed, all on autopilot during the length of your subscription. Get 20% off your Delete Me plan when you go to joindeleteme.com forward slash HMW and use promo code HMW at checkout. That's joindeleteme.com forward slash HMW code HMW. Corporate America didn't always have the dangerous obsession with shareholder value that it does today. And even after the landmark Dodge vs. Ford case in 1919, companies were slow to change. Between the mid-1960s and 1970s, American stock markets traded mostly sideways. Corporate CEOs still had a duty to do what was best for the company, but they were paid a normal salary and a small bonus just like every other normal employee. 
According to the Economic Policy Institute and the National Bureau of Labor Statistics, CEOs at this time made around 20 times as much as the average employee of their company. So they were still rich, but not so rich that they could retire after one good year. Their motivation was primarily to keep the company running safely so they could maintain their well-paid jobs for as long as possible. By the 1990s, a small group of financiers got the idea that in order to grow to get better returns from their companies, they should align the interests of their CEO with their own interests of getting the stock price as high as possible. They did this by paying the CEOs a smaller cash salary, but added stock options that directly tied CEO bonuses to stock performance. In the 1990s, CEO compensation went from 60 times average worker pay to 380 times average worker pay. My friend Patrick Boyle did a great video on how this small change in corporate norms eventually led to people like Elon Musk demanding $50 billion in compensation for one year's work. Now that there was so much money to be made, CEOs and other senior executives were happy to go along with the lie that it was their legal duty to maximize shareholder value, even if it would destroy their companies in the long term. The first strategy they used was picking up pennies in front of a steamroller. It won't surprise you that some of the biggest companies in the world have taken dumb risks. We have seen some of the biggest corporate bankruptcies in history happen in just the past 24 months, and it's becoming more common. If you are a CEO with a multi-million dollar bonus package on the table, you are going to do everything in your power to tick the boxes you need for the board to grant you that bonus. A top priority for you as the CEO is going to be to increase your company stock price, pay a big dividend, or both. Most bonuses are awarded year to year, and according to Fortune magazine, the average tenure of a Fortune 500 CEO is now only 7 years. For you, big projects that could pay off over decades are effectively useless, unless their announcement could drive up your stock price, but even that's unlikely. Investors rarely care about long-term business strategies because they so rarely come true anyway. Your best strategy is to control bad publicity and focus on next quarter's financials. An easy place to cut expenses is in areas like security, auditing, risk management, safety controls, long-term development, and training. If you cut these enough, you might even increase revenue at the same time, because sales staff and revenue centers can operate more freely without pesky compliance departments making sure things aren't being done illegally. Silicon Valley Bank, one of the largest bank failures in American history, had a risk management department that regulators described as terrible. That's about the harshest thing that financial regulators say about anything. Lehman Brothers went bankrupt because it couldn't say no to the revenue it was making from subprime mortgage bonds. Boeing's repeated string of airline failures has been blamed on a push to get new planes into the air by cutting down on safety controls and testing. HSBC, one of the biggest banks in the world, made billions of dollars in revenue by providing financial services to international criminals. People have lost their jobs, lost savings, and lost their lives in these scandals. But worse than all of that, the shareholders lost billions of dollars from scandals like these and others that are too numerous to list. But the CEOs that ultimately oversaw the companies making these terrible risk trade-offs already made their enormous bonuses, and some of them even got a golden parachute on the way out. Business departments like risk management and cybersecurity have tough jobs. If everything is going well, people question what good they are doing for the business. If things are going badly, people question what good they are doing for the business. You can make a little money by picking up pennies in front of a steamroller, but if something goes wrong, you get smushed all for a few dollars. The short-sighted nature of CEOs mandated to maximize shareholder value is also the second reason it's one of the worst ideas in the history of business. It guarantees that businesses become worse. Jack Welch was the chairman and CEO of General Electric from 1981 to 2001. He worked his way up in the company from an entry-level position, but upon stepping into the top job, he radically reshaped the company in the name of the shareholders. Welch made 72,000 of GE's 400,000 employees redundant. He sold off entire company divisions, and he invested heavily in financial and media arms of the business. GE Capital became the primary focus of an engineering company that made consumer appliances, commercial machinery, and aerospace parts. Welch also pioneered outsourcing, and bragged about it on CNBC, a news network he created to focus on business news after GE acquired NBC. His ruthless strategy worked. And during his 20 years as CEO, GE stock price rose from $6 a share to a high of almost $370 a share a year before being asked to walk away from the company. He did, but not before being awarded an exit package estimated at $417 million. Other CEOs who were now getting paid mainly with stock options saw this maverick CEO talking about his strategies on his own news network, and they figured they couldn't argue with the results. 
According to data from the Economic Policy Institute, the year that Jack Welch took over as the CEO of General Electric was the last year when increases in worker productivity kept pace with increases in wages. Make of that what you would. Welch's focus on shareholder above every other stakeholder in the business worked well for a long time. But since he was pushed out of the company, the stock price of GE has fallen by roughly 70% from its all-time high, even during a record bull run where the market is up by 400%. GE used to make high-quality products that customers were highly loyal to. GE's outsourcing delivered worse products to the market, leading customers to buy from other brands. GE used to be one of the most attractive companies to work for because they were stable, paid well, and let employees, like Jack Welch himself, work their way up the corporate ladder. GE's CEO proudly boasting about mass layoffs and firing the bottom 10% of staff every year meant it became one of the least desirable companies to work for, so top talent went elsewhere. By sacrificing customers and employees to appease shareholders, they made it worse for them, too. Welch himself even said in an interview that maximizing shareholder value was stupid. A high stock price is the result of doing everything else correctly. Why didn't he follow his own advice? Well, because he made too much money by keeping the people that paid him happy. During Welch's tenure as CEO, GE was almost suspiciously good at meeting financial goals. Roger Martin, the dean of the Rotman School of Business at the University of Toronto, said in an interview with Forbes that GE met or beat analyst forecasts in 46 of 48 quarters between December 31, 1989 and September 30, 2001, a 96% hit rate. Even more impressive, in 41 of those 46 quarters, GE hit the analyst forecasts to the exact penny, 89% perfection. Of course, this wasn't amazing management. It was good old-fashioned creative accounting, a practice that got GE in hot water with the SEC and was part of the reason why Welch was eventually asked to nicely leave the company. Despite his tarnished record, Welch's business practices are still common in a lot of corporate boardrooms across the world. Okay, so you might ask if encouraging CEOs to pursue short-term gains has shown to be bad for everyone, including the shareholders who appoint the board, who employ the CEO, why are companies still doing this? Well. That's because the third reason why maximizing shareholder value is a terrible idea for everyone. The short term is all that matters. According to data from the largest stock exchanges in America, the average holding period for stocks has been consistently declining for decades. In 1975, investors held onto stocks for an average of five years. In 2021, they held onto them for less than one year. Electronic brokerages have made buying and selling shares much easier. And people are generally in financial situations that are much less secure where selling shares becomes a way to cover an unexpected expense. That's not how long-term investing should be done, but staying ahead financially these days is hard. The largest dips in shareholder holding periods happened in 2001 and 2008, during down markets and job losses where people were probably selling at a loss on their holdings but needed to cover their expenses one way or another. Long-term capital gains tax laws also encourage people to seek profits from buying and selling year-to-year -year rather than a dividend strategy which can be less tax-efficient. The result is that if people are holding onto shares for less time, then they also only care about short-term wins. So a CEO that delivers a profitable fourth quarter will be more popular than a CEO who reinvests company earnings into training, R&D, or safety that won't pay off for years. This kind of short-term thinking is not sustainable. But that's another shareholder and CEO's problem. But this isn't the only way. I am going to write an op-ed on business and leadership teams that I have worked with in the real world that are doing things a little bit differently to great success on my totally free email newsletter Compounded Daily. For free articles like this, and to get access to these videos a day early, sign up for that in the description below. If you want to see just how bad things can get in the name of shareholder value, go and watch my video on the deadly monetization of nursing homes to find out how this exact business strategy has caused the death of tens of thousands of vulnerable Americans. And don't forget to like and subscribe to keep on learning how money works.